Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Stan Pierre-Louis. I'm the president and CEO of the Entertainment Software Association. We serve as the um, uh, voice and advocate for the US video game industry uh, throughout the United States. And we're here to really talk about an exciting topic, something that is really front of mind. We heard it on stage earlier, and it's in every conversation we have today. Um, and it's the role of artificial intelligence in society today. And uh, no one could be better to talk about this topic than uh, the person I have sitting next to me. Um, Haiyan Jung uh, has 25 years of experience in engineering as a researcher, uh, technology architect. Uh, she currently um, leads the gaming AI initiative that sits at the intersection of Microsoft Research, uh, Azure, OpenAI, and Xbox. So it's a real thrill to have someone who's really sitting at the seat uh, at the table and in the room where it happens. So, Diane, thank you for making time for this conversation. Thanks, Dan. It's really great to be here. Hi, everybody. Um, it's kind of an honor to be on the stage. So thanks to Megan and Dice for inviting me and us to come talk about this really important topic. Terrific. Well, let, let's dive right in. Um, AI is in the news every day. Every day I have a conversation with executives, business leaders, uh, people in the community, policymakers, journalists. AI is in front of everybody's minds. So lots to talk about. Before we do, though, let's learn something about you. What is your role at Xbox? Thanks, Dan. Well, I think beyond the title of the role, I think the role itself, so I have this mission, and my mission is to bring to life AI innovation that enriches people's lives. And I think that means two critical things. One is to convene critical thinking and ideas and discussions within Xbox, within Microsoft, and where opportunities arise within the games industry. And secondly, I sit at this nexus of various teams working on the different pieces of this puzzle of AI innovation, which is the Azure cloud infrastructure, compute, and AI services, our open AI partnership, Microsoft research that's working on new frontier models, going beyond the foundation models we've seen so far, and of course, across all the Xbox teams that's working so closely with players and developers and really understanding some of the challenges that they face where new technology tools can really support them. And it's interesting that we're having this conversation now because AI as a field of computer science has been around for many decades and actually games has been an integral part of the history of AI. So for example, in the 1950s, early AI researchers really used games like chess to kind of figure out what artificial intelligence actually means and to devise algorithms that would mimic and behave and reason like humans in order to play complex games. In the last decade, we've seen, AI, we've seen video games be used as environments in which to train AI algorithms and models and to push forward the state of the art on the science. So games like Pac-Man, Montezuma's Revenge, Pitfall, have all been used by AI researchers as a way to accelerate the work that they're doing. So in a way, you know, we've actually, video games have fueled AI research. And at the same time, as the AI technology has evolved and improved, we've been there along the way, right along that journey, folding new AI developments into games, into our ecosystem to make player experiences better. So for example, uh, you know, uh, several years ago, we have been leveraging AI techniques like Bayesian inference for matchmaking on several of our titles to ensure that when players are matching with others, you know, it, when a game first starts and there's a smaller population, we can find just the right player for you to play with. Uh, there are other AI technologies like Drivatars, which first launched over a decade ago using early machine learning techniques. So I think AI isn't new. We've been evolving with AI in the games industry. And at the same time, you're right, we are now in this pivotal moment. It feels like there's been a step change because new, the convergence of uh, compute uh, data has meant that a new set, a new class of AI models now exists, which we loosely call generative AI. And this is opening up new opportunities for us in the video game space, in society in general. And there's a lot of topics to really dig into and for us to discuss as a society, but also as a games industry. 
it's interesting, you, you take us through this progression which really does identify AI as part of the industry and yet it feels like we're at this inflection point. Um, and maybe since the release of ChatGPT in December of 2022, this has become a conversation um, at every level of government in every conversation with business leaders and the like. That's what we're sensing on the outside. What does it feel like inside of Xbox? So beyond the working through the dynamics that you just described, um, what are you sensing? Are we at this inflection point or how are you uh, dealing with this new momentum? Thank you. Um, so, you know, we talked about a evolution in the technology and also this being at once an evolution and a step change. Sometimes when these things happen, we get dazzled by the technology and we focus too much on technology for technology's sake. So I know, you know, when ChatGPT came out, all my friends, everybody was on, on the website and saying, oh, okay, I tried this and it worked. Wow, this is really amazing. Um, and so we go through this phase where uh, we're all dazzled by the technology, we're focused on it. And it's really important to take a step back and say, okay, we've seen the technology. Now, how can we really apply that to bring value to our lives, to our society, to communities, to, to really enrich the experiences that we have. And that takes deliberate focus and deliberate thought. And that can be difficult because sometimes we are, there's the dazzle, well, let's just put the dazzle on everything. Um, as an example, you know, I have a friend, she, uh, you know, she logged onto ChatGPT and then the other day she said to me, hey, hi Ant, you know what's really cool is I had ChatGPT organize my um, honeymoon. So she was taking a road trip from Seattle to California and she didn't have time to plan it. So she just asked the AI, hey, I wanna make this road trip. I wanna make these stops. Can you tell me the stops? Can you tell me where to stay? And it was really just supporting her in what she wanted to do. It couldn't take the road trip for her, but it was helping her organize, bringing value um, to her day to day. Um, I, I'm kind of reminded of my own experience with technology. So I'm a, I'm a technology optimist and I really believe that, you know, technology is just a set of tools and it really brings value when you can use those tools, when you piece parts together to make new tools that can really help people, that can really bring new meaning into people's lives. So as an example, so when I was eight years old, uh, my family moved from China to Australia, and it was a decade after the Cultural Revolution. So when I was growing up in my hometown, we, we didn't have that much, I didn't see that much technology. We had a black and white TV. Um, and uh, you know, I, when I walked down the street, uh, most of the time there'd be a policeman directing traffic, um, uh, and I, and all the traffic were bicycles. So I actually never sat in a family car till I was like nine years old, because um, nobody owned cars. Um, and we landed in Adelaide, and we're just walking down the street. I'm taking in this new environment, and we get to the crosswalk, and there isn't there isn't a policeman, and there's a pole, and on the pole there's a button. And I'm like, what is this? And apparently, you're supposed to press the button, and then you look up, and there's a light across the road, and there's, you know, the red and the, and the green man. And if you press the button, you kind of tell the sign, hey, I want to cross. And, if, you know, when it's uh, the appropriate time, the green man lights up and tells you that you can cross. And I was, I was really amazed by this technology. I mean, it's very simple technology. It's a button, there's some wires, a light. Um, but I was really amazed because for the first time I could see, hey, I can indicate, I can say what I want to cross and this environment helps me, this technology helps me to cross. And also this button made this weird chirping noise. You know, when you press it, it started making a chirping noise and it would change. And I was like, why is this? And it was because somebody had thought to design this piece of technology to support people with sight impairment. Um, and that was amazing that you could make a tool and the tool would support me, but also others in the community um, who had, uh, you know, disabilities. And to me, this is a, a seminal moment in thinking about, hey, maybe I could make tools to help people, but it really starts with understanding people, with empowering people. 
And I always say, you know, when we're making tools, whether it's AI tools or not, we're really focused on supporting and not replacing. And that's really important. And if we just, we've been talking about AI, so if we look at the bare bones of this step change in AI, um, you know, for the last, I talked about AI that we've been shipping in Xbox, for the last decade, we've been thinking about AI and machine learning models as custom applications. So you would have a, a specific feature, you would have a custom feature, and you would gather all of your data, and you would have a team of specialists, and their job was to train that model to do this very specific job. And you would be able to use that model for this, you would make another model for this. And the step change is really these larger, what we call foundation models, that have been trained on the entirety of human knowledge that's been captured digitally. And the models can now reason over many different domains. So it's almost like their AI operating systems. They're operating systems on which you can build many different apps. And that in turn has meant that that technology has become much more democratized. I think that many of us have already logged on and, and tried to program ChatGPT with prompts. It's opened up this new discipline of prompt engineering. And to get back to the seminal moment, I think we need to really focus on that technology is evolving and it will move forward with or without, without us, but the future is not written. Technology moving forward is not the future. The future is what we write and what we say the technology should do. And that future we need to co-author together. And that's what I'm here to say. Let's co-author, let's work together and figure out what that future is for the games industry where AI can really make an impact. We well, you know as um, someone who represents a, a, an industry, uh, it's heartening to see not only our past but our future uh, as part of that um, that growth and that innovation. We you know we're often underappreciated, at least we used to be as an industry. And over the years, and particularly during COVID, a lot of people in society, you know, policymakers began to see the value of games not only um, for the fun and entertainment, which is why we make the games. Uh, but also in connecting people, uh, the cultural impact we have, and now looking at that innovative future. At the same time, within our industry and outside the industry, people are saying, okay, what's next? It's great that we're doing this, that the future is not yet written, but what's next? So how do you think about that at Xbox, about how we write this future together? Well, I think it starts with being grounded in our mission as an industry. What are we here to do? Why do we make games? At Xbox, we've distilled that into a sentence, and you all might have your own sentence. Uh, our sentence is bring the joy and community of gaming to everyone on the planet. And so when we look at AI tools, we're thinking about how might we use AI to bring more joy to the craft of game making, and could AI bring more fun, more delight to game playing. And that doesn't come easily, and we have to do that responsibly. It starts with understanding what people need and finding the right pieces of AI or non-AI technologies that can come together and form those solutions. So I'll give you another example, a, a few years ago, uh, I had the privilege of uh, collaborating with the BBC in the UK, and we uh, worked on a series called Big Life Fix, where myself and, and other technologists, we got to meet communities and individuals in need across the UK, and we were tasked with thinking about what are some technology solutions that we could invent, we could piece together to really support these individuals, and they were folks with uh, you know, chronic illness, some with uh, early onset Parkinson's or cystic fibrosis. And I uh, met a young lady, uh, Armin, who is uh, 12 years old. And Armin had uh, been in a, a terrible car accident with her family and she suffered tra a traumatic brain injury. And she had done an amazing job recovering. She had to learn to walk again, but you know, she'd really recovered. But the one thing that she hadn't recovered was her short-term memory. So Armin was going to her local school. She was in you know, a regular classroom, but because she didn't have short-term memory, which meant you know, she, could, she wouldn't be able to remember something that happened 15 minutes ago, 
it really took away from her classroom education experience. So, you know, the teacher would set an activity, uh, would say, okay, now we're doing this exercise, and all the kids would be doing it, and then Armin would actually not be able to do the exercise because she couldn't capture the instructions. She couldn't remember them. So I went into the classroom and I, I sat with Armin, who was just doing a phenomenal job powering through these moments and still being optimistic. And then I said, well, what are some technologies we can piece together to really support her in this situation? Um, and at the time, you know, I just took some simple speech to text service and then we hooked that up to a tablet and we just said, hey, you know, when the teacher is uh, doing the lesson, we could just take what she's saying and record it in kind of like a diary. And then if Amun ever really needs to reflect on it, she could scroll back in the diary and when she taps on a sentence, it would play back what the teacher had said. And it's pretty simple tech, but it, when we deployed it in her classroom, we could see it had this profound impact on her lived experience. And I think those are the moments that we are looking for. It's not about the tools, it's about the people, but how do you bring the tools together to support those people? Right, right. Um, I, I think that's a powerful use of technology because I think in the end, I think you said it earlier, technology for technology's sake isn't the goal. It's what is the purpose behind it, whether it's gaining knowledge, entertainment, and in this case, healing. Um, so I think the humanity and technology we heard here, we heard on the prior talk, and we certainly heard on some of the earlier talks, so uh, that's very powerful. You mentioned as part of that in the development of AI, responsible AI. What does that mean at Xbox? Uh, so, you know, I talked about AI and programming for AI. With these new foundation models and this new discipline of prompt engineering, AI is really bringing about a shift, a paradigm shift in software engineering. Uh, and we need new processes to test and validate what these uh, new AI solutions do. Just like in software engineering, the last 20, 30 years, we developed unit testing, we developed play testing, and responsible AI is another set of tools for us to test our software now incorporating AI. So I think of responsible AI as how we hold ourselves accountable. Um, it is a, a body of research. It is also uh, a blueprint, a set of principles that Microsoft published um, last year and is continuing to update as we learn and continuing to take feedback and work with other companies and um, other institutions around the world to think about, hey, what are the ways that we hold all of us accountable, and how do we validate our assumptions? So responsible AI is comprised of, of two main things. One is a set of questions we ask ourselves, the principles themselves. And we ask ourselves questions of fairness. Is the data we're collecting fair and representative of everybody in the community that we're serving? Reliability and safety, privacy and security. Are we handling the data in a considered, thoughtful, compliant way? Inclusiveness, are we being inclusive of everybody in the community that these AI products are going to bring value to everybody, everybody that's using them? Transparency and accountability. So those are the principles. And then the second piece is a set of tools where we can verify our assumptions. So these are software engineering tools, they're testing processes where we ask ourselves the questions and then we can test against those questions. You also talked earlier about um, using technology to support but not replace human innovation. How does that look at Xbox? So first and foremost, it starts with understanding our users, which are the players and the developers. That, that player experience, that developer experience. What is it? What is that journey for different types of players and developers in our community, where are we seeing barriers and frictions in those experiences that we could create new tools to help overcome? Uh, as an example, you know, software engineering is a, a kind of well-known practice, and so of course it makes sense that software development is one of the first areas where new tools are being created. 
I myself am a lapsed software engineer. Uh, and uh, coming back to software engineering, you know, after several years, one, I was really amazed by new features like uh, code completion you know, in Visual Studio, but also I did some iOS development and an Xcode as well. So when you start typing in an API call, it just starts filling in that, uh, the rest of the, the function for you, which has no AI in it. It's just a, a basic supportive tool. I found it amazing because then you could, you could actually program an entire app without actually reading the API docs. Um, so we've seen these supportive tools evolve and now, when you know AI and, and we saw the power of uh, GPT coming in, uh, the uh, GitHub team and the Visual Studio team took those AI capabilities and said, oh, well, okay, how can we take these capabilities and evolve those tools for software engineers? And that's where they developed GitHub Copilot, where beyond completing for your API call, GitHub Copilot is now looking at the code and say, okay, well, you're doing this thing, so let me actually try to predict what is, are you trying to write a, a for loop? Let me just fill in the for loop for you, so you just have to key in the, the uh, parameters you want, so you don't have to write all the syntax of the for loop. So the, co the Copilot now leveraging AI is adding that extra layer of support for software engineers. And we have released this, um, this tool over a year ago, and since then we've been you know, working with different software developers as they're leveraging the tool. And we found through surveys that software engineers that's using this tool are getting 55% faster productivity, 55% faster at writing their code. And it's not all the code. It's just that this tool, the GitHub Copilot, removes the drudgery and the repetitive tasks in writing code. So it's not about targeting everything. It's about, hey, where, where can the AI really help and lend a hand? And how can we shape the tools to make that be valuable to our users? Wow, if, if you're a lapsed software engineer, uh, that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, obviously I sit in Washington and spend a lot of time talking to policymakers and I think in the industry people have these conversations as well. Um, more and more people are talking about the complexities of AI and how it impacts so many different areas of life, whether it's how does it impact workforce, how is it gonna impact traditional IP frameworks. Um, I guess, how do you guys think about those complex issues? Because they're still developing and yet there are lots of questions around them. So how do you think about it at Xbox and Microsoft? So these are really big, important topics for our society. These new models have opened up discussions that we need to have. Um, and they're very valuable discussions for what we believe in as a society and how we should move forward together. There are, as you said, many parallel conversations. So here today, we're talking, you know, we're having a conversation about the games industry and the impact on the games industry. There are also conversations you're part of, you know, in terms of in Washington and other conversations I'm part of. I think within this room and our industry, our responsibility, and this is something that, you know, we are, practicing at Xbox, our responsibility is to really learn and understand what AI is and then be able to educate folks, perhaps within our industry or outside of our industry, of that AI impact in video games. Just like you, you know, we've been talking about your work over the years on educating policymakers about the games industry and how there might be misunderstandings of certain elements in, in the games industry. Um, I think that that will also arise about how AI might impact the games industry. And I think it's vital that we all learn what AI is and be able to inf be, have informed conversations there. I think that what we are at this point now where, as I said earlier, the technology is evolving and the future is unwritten. And we could lean back and have others write that future for us, or we could choose to define what that future is for us. And I would love for us all to participate in shaping that future, whatever that might be, and I think it starts with finding opportunities where these tools might be able to add value 
to the things that we're creating. I want to I want to take us back to where you started, which is the player experience. You've talked about how this saves developers time by finishing code and the like. Uh, you talked about how it might save costs for publishers. What does this mean for the player experience? Right. Well, as someone who plays games, there are many I feel frustrations and barriers and frictions in the game experience, um, and I think we also feel it too as publishers, as developers. Um, I think one thing we have heard is uh, from developers is, hey, I made a game. How do I find an audience for my game? How do I connect just the right player that would love my game to my game? And you know, there are many features in storefronts, searching, recommendations. Um, and some recommendations in the past have leveraged AI techniques. Well, now there might be new possibilities for helping players connect to the games and content that they love. Uh, another piece about how AI might benefit players is there are many moments, so when you connect, a, when a player is connected to the game, they're playing the game, we also know there are many moments when we can lose those players, right? We want those players to engage with our world, with our stories, and form communities, and have deep appreciation for the thing that we've made. But there are many moments, little moments that we didn't anticipate where we're just, we're, it doesn't happen. Um, so, you know, if I didn't play Cocoon for a week, and now I just, I don't remember this ordering of the puzzles. Like, like how do I get back into the game? And I think there are moments here where we can think about new tools that helps players more deeply engage with the art that we create. And those tools might be leveraging AI or not AI, but it's about that this new technology is enabling us to think about what these new tools are. A final um, possibility, potential for players, is something that I'm really passionate about, which is could AI help us create completely new game genres and experiences? And you know, I, I would like to think that we could. I don't know what these games and experiences are. I've had some conversations at DICE with some folks who are thinking along these lines. It kind of reminds me of, um, you know, in the early 1800s, if you were standing in Manhattan and you looked across the landscape, there was not a building taller than five stories. You know why? Because there were no elevators and people didn't like to climb more than five stories. So all the buildings across the Manhattan landscape were five stories tall. And then in the mid 1800s, electric elevators were invented and started being installed in buildings. And from there, we could see new buildings and a diversity of architecture, you know, really invigorating architecture as an art form and a discipline. And we saw the buildings like the Chrysler Building, the Empire State Building, and eventually powering you know, architects like Frank Gehry to make amazing creations. So if we think about these tools as elevators, could we build elevators to make even more amazing games? And I think that is a hypothesis that I would love to continue the conversation on. Um, and that's something that I'm, I'm pretty excited about. That's pretty powerful. Um, we only have a a little bit of time left, so I'll just uh, send us out on this as we close. Uh, any key takeaways uh, for people to think about as we think about AI moving forward? Uh, well, it's a short conversation, so we, you know, I'd love to have deeper conversations, and I think that's part of my call to action for us to co-author this future together. Technology evolves, but technology evolving is not the future. We get to write that future together, so let's have those conversations. And then I think that future means thinking about AI innovation that puts people, players, and developers first, and it's not technology for its own sake. Terrific, terrific. Well, thank you for that. Oh, Stan, and then what are your oh. takeaways as well? I'm oh, excited wow. to hear. Oh, I get, I get to do a takeaway. Uh, I'm struck by uh, the length of time. When yeah. we talk to people about AI and how yeah. long the video game industry has been involved, and so I think it's important that we as an industry, as we talk about what we do, to talk about this really being something that's been evolving for some time. Yeah. Obviously, ChatGPT and generative AI add to that conversation in a very meaningful way. 
um, but it's not new. And so from my perspective, as we talk to policymakers, it's let innovators innovate. Companies big and small are doing a lot of exciting things around AI and let's let that happen. And I think my second, because on the moderator, so I get two, is um, having a brain like yours wrestling with these issues is, is really great for our industry. So thank you for your insights. Thank you for what you do every day. And thank you for making time. And just thank you guys for hanging in there for the conversation. Uh, let's continue this conversation over lunch and in the hallways over the next day. So thank you. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Awesome. <laughs>